Hi, Nick. Welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. Hey, Melissa. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for asking. How are you? I'm great. It's kind of crazy that it's the end of the year already. Uh, oh, my goodness. Right? This much. is airing in January, but we're recording it in the middle of December. Uh, it's really cold, and I think we're about to get our first snow here in central Illinois. Where are you oh, joining us from? Wow, your first snow. In central Illinois in December. Isn't that a weird thing? Are you guys supposed to get snow in like October? You know, it's feast or famine. November okay. is really the wild card. November can be in the 60s or it can be miserable and cold. But mm. generally, Thanksgiving is about the earliest, but we don't get substantial snow until January usually. That's good. I guess it could be worse. It could be like Buffalo or something where I think they had, what, six feet of snow at one point a couple of weeks ago. That That's like seven feet too many. <laughs> Jeez. Yeah. Um, I don't own a shovel big enough. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. You need, you need actual equipment to be able to get rid of human sized snow. That's crazy. Uh, I'm actually flying to see, nah, I don't want to say snow, but cold country is what I call it. So I'm in the Tampa Bay area now, but I originally grew up in Philly. So I'm used to the snow and the four seasons. I lived in, uh, in Philly for about 30 years. Spent a little bit of time in Portland, Oregon, and then moved to Florida. And, you know, I, I always used to joke with people like, hey, maybe I'll move to Florida when I retire, my 60s or something like that. I moved here in my 30s. And now people are like, you're going to move to Philly? You're going to move back home? I'm like, no, no, no. It doesn't <laughs> snow on Christmas. And they're like, but don't you miss that? I'm like, no, I could see snow on, you know, pictures that you guys send me. But I can also sit in my pool on Christmas. So feel free to come on down. Yeah, there you go. So, Nick, what do you do? I do a lot. Uh, I guess the easiest way to be able to put it is, is I'm a podcast host for the Mindset and Self Mastery show. I'm a mindset self mastery coach. That's what led me into the podcast. Uh, and outside of that, I'm a sales leader for a 3D content company. So I run sales for the consumer products division. And we do 3D modeling all the way up to augmented and virtual reality. And uh, it's interesting how all of that ties into psychology. And overall mindset, we talk about customers' mindsets and their journeys on the product side, specifically when it comes to the 3D content company. Likewise, with my clients, I talk about their mindset and their daily lives with their careers and all that. And same with the show. I have incredible guests on the show, just like you do, where we get into deep, deep things, things that have, uh, you know, the traumas that have helped shape people and what they've done with them. Some of the stuff that some people are actively processing through and some that people haven't fully processed through and some of it's live right there on the show. Uh, so I think that's kind of a quick version of what I do. It sounds fascinating. Have you experienced trauma in your life as well? Uh, if I didn't, I don't know how I would be human. Right. Like I think everybody at some point has had some sort of trauma. And that's an interesting question because I think there's, you know, things are relative, right? Like mm -hmm. somebody's trauma uh, looks different, feels different from somebody else's trauma. And I had this actually happen to me. Like I, I think about, um, I had conversations with my ex-wife at one point. I had, I was molested as a child. There were things that had happened. Um, and we can go into details if you really want to. Uh, but, you know, just at a surface level, there were sexual things that had happened. Uh, there was something with my ex-wife where there was something that had happened, but things are relative. And I remember saying to her, like, how dare you compared to these things? And as the words came out of my mouth, I was like, how dare me? This is all relative. My trauma is different than her trauma. And how she goes about it is different than how I would go about it. And likewise with clients or people that are on the show, or just honestly, people you start to shoot the breeze with at a bar. You know, being able to get in tough conversations with people. So I think everybody has some sort of trauma. It's just a matter of, do you realize it and have you, or are you actively working on it or doing something about it? Um, and I get confused as people get older in life and they don't do things with it. You know, like, how can you not 
you've lived with this for 30 years or 40 years or 50 years or whatever. And I know that it can break down on people, but I think that's part of the reason why I have the show and why I do the coaching is as you act on it and you work through it, just like a muscle going to the gym, you will actively get better in basically everything else you do because you're doing that thing. But sometimes it takes us a long time to be able to do that. And I think you and I can probably agree. Sometimes God will throw us curveballs, and you're like, cool, am I going to hit this one? Oh, is this one going to hit me? Am I going to catch it? I know it? nothing I'm... about what you speak, Nick. Yes. I have no familiarity. Yes, with that you know all. exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. And you're <laughs> like, oh, I got that curveball with my chin, you know, and like, that's not where it's supposed to go. No. Uh, well, you know, a couple of things came up for me when you were talking there. One, um, I think we discount our trauma because we have a way of subconsciously classifying it. Well, yeah, I've had some difficulties, but I didn't have that. Yeah. And yeah. Whatever that is for people. Yeah. So we have a way of discounting those things that happen to us is, well, yeah, you know, if it were serious, if it were violence, if it were abuse, if it was molestation, if it was do pt you know ptsd experience from yeah. a war zone you know then those things would be legit and i could call that trauma and deal with it but i think we do ourselves a real disservice when like you said when we start classifying that because everyone's experience is different yeah have yeah, you there's... read victor frankel's book man's search for meaning man did i have i read that okay. uh that's got um that's got a big meaning to me. So it's interesting because I, I don't typically just get into stuff about my divorce or my ex-wife and our relationship, especially right off the bat in a conversation like this. So it's interesting how that actually happened. And then you asked me about Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, so about two years ago, there was this, I don't know, uh, library bar that was put together in some small little town near me that a friend of mine was like, Hey, a buddy of mine just opened up a library bar. Like you can go drink a beer and read a book. I'm like, I'm that in. sounds amazing. Yeah. I was like, let's do this. This is great. And yeah. it was a little bit of a ways away from my house, but I was like, Hey man, I'll come out. I'll meet you whatever. And I don't like to drink and drive really. So I was like, all right, I'll just have a beer. And meanwhile, at one point I found myself having a beer and doing this, you know, the sideways walk as you're looking at books and the bookshelf. And mm -hmm. this tiny little beat up book stood out to me and I didn't know what it was, but I knew like those little God nods where it's like, God tells you, go grab this thing. So I just grabbed it and I looked and it was man's search for meaning. And it was one of the older copies of it just sitting mm -hmm. in this bar. And I remember uh, going up to the bar and like putting it down. The bartender was like, what's that? I was like, man's search for meaning. I rattled off. Like I haven't read it yet, but you know, this, I heard great things about it. He was like, all right, cool. He was like, hey, man, this is yours. Have at it. And I think they were selling it for like a buck or something. So it was a little nicety. But I remember taking that thing home and spending the next three weeks basically straight reading it. And at that time, I was actively working through internally, how am I going to get a divorce? How do I ask for this thing? Do I ask? Do I demand? <laughs> do I, you know, what, how do I do this? And kind of waiting in a sense for God to slap me in the face or throw me that curveball, Because I have those prayers at times where I'm like, all right, smack me in the nose to get me to notice something, but you don't need to break my nose. Like I don't need to have <laughs> blood all over the place. But you know, if like you, you, even if you picked your nose the weird one way, you're like, ah, it hurts a little bit. Like that's one of right. those things. Just like poke me in the nose. So I go, okay, cool. I got it. Um, that book was like smashing my nose open mm. and I got it. Because as I was reading through it, the biggest thing was there's meaning in suffering and how this guy could take the practice that he was going through, then put it into practice and speak into existence what he was going to do after the fact and then do all of that. And I could read all of it. It made it so much easier to then go, all right, God, I got it. And walk back into the house and say, hey, we need to finish that conversation we had two weeks ago. This is the end of it. And that was... Yeah the thing that helped me over that hump in that moment. Like, it's not the thing where, you know, it just encapsulated all of it, but it was, that was huge. So yeah, uh, yes, I've read it to get back to the original question. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. I had no idea you had, and it had such a profound effect, but spoke yeah. to me from it. And if you haven't read this book yet, he was a prisoner in a Nazi camp. 
during World War II. The most miserable existence, subsistence, if you will. Yeah. All of the things that you've heard about those camps he experienced, every bit of it. And yet he did well in the camps, not because he had any favors from anyone. It was the opposite of that, mm -hmm. to be sure. But because <laughs> of his mindset, he yeah. decided in his mind that that space between his ears, no one else could have. No one else could have that space. He owned that space. And no matter what happened in this world, he got to decide what lived in that space. Yeah. And because of that, he came through that experience and he came through that experience better than many others. And then his practice as a psychologist, once people found out that he had that experience, they would apologize for their trauma or for whatever it was <laughs> that brought them into treatment. And he would say, no, pain is pain. Yeah. Pain will fill a vacuum, whatever you have. So that was what came to mind for me earlier when hmm. you were unpacking that bit. Yeah. I and mean, that's it's crazy that that book was instrumental in your life. Big time. And well, I think, uh, I think again, there are things, um, uh, that tie into faith where you're open to those things showing up. Like, uh, mm -hmm. I don't really like to have expectations of many things, but I do expect to see miracles. And I know that that can be crazy for people to think, but it's not when if you're looking for the things you'll see them you just got to be aware of it and you got to get yourself to a point where you can become aware of it and sometimes god will throw a book at your face from some random library bar an hour and 15 minutes from your house in the middle of you about to get a divorce you know what i mean right um, and it's so cool how that stuff happens but if i wasn't aware of that i it would have just passed over me so i i think with again with that trauma and going through those things, going back through what has happened and healing through that will also lead to other opportunities to be able to see where those miracles can come from, you know? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, we can ask God or higher power or spirit, whatever title that you like best, we can ask that spirit, that source, that love to show us something, to reveal yeah. a next step. And it's probably not going to show up on our TV screen like a Netflix commercial, but it will become mm. present to us yeah. in a lot of different ways Yeah, if I, we're ready to receive it. I do think there are some times where stuff will happen. Like, uh, you know those times when you're changing through radio stations, you're scanning and like sentences will form. They're like, today yeah. on the show. And they're like, well, and it's two different episodes of two <laughs> things, you know? And you're like, oh, God. I do find it interesting, like when you're hyper aware of those miracles that are happening around you, where you can see God kind of playing and things opening up. And I think that's kind of that different level that we're able to get to kind of a quantum level or even angelic level where you can look at things at a spiritual plane to see the things that are happening. But it takes mm -hmm. us going through the, the craziness to be able to kind of experience that. Uh, it's funny. Um, have you ever heard of the show, The Chosen? Yes. All right. So. I've, uh, I've just started watching the chosen and I'm, I've been a Bible reader for years and years and years and years. And it's interesting because I, I had watched the chosen out of order. Like when I first downloaded it, I was great. This is the first episode. And it was episode one of season two. I was like, hey, this doesn't make sense. Like there should be backstory, but yeah, whatever. All right, cool. I know these stories anyway. And where I got like six or seven episodes in, I was like, wait a minute, this is weird. Hang and on. I looked. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I missed totally season one. But at that point, when I was watching the first six, seven episodes, what I was reading was I was finishing off Samuel, the second Samuel. And at the end of second Samuel, I was like, I'm going to start the uh, New Testament again. I'm just going to start with Matthew and just to kind of work my way through. And if I didn't do that, it wouldn't have lined up for me to go back to season two and watch the episodes again from Matthew. Yeah. But that hit me when I started to read again. And I was like, I just watched this episode and here he is saying it. But <laughs> if I would have done this in order, it would have been, uh, you know, in, in the middle of David doing something crazy and Philistines coming after him and, you know, everybody right. killing each other, basically. Um, <laughs> so it's interesting how that stuff kind of ties in where he shows up. I think of it as God showing up and like kind of laughing, being like, yeah, dude, I did this. Like, you're welcome. You know? Yeah. I've had a couple moments 
like that. Uh, when I left seminary, graduated seminary, I came to the small little town that I serve now, still some 21 years later. But at the time, this was just going to be my practice interview. My real hmm. church was down south. And I was going to get my practice in here so I would be good to go when I interviewed them down in that in that wooded paradise where I knew God was calling me to go. So I come up to this place to interview. And I'm originally from Illinois. And that was also part of the deal. Okay, God, I'll go anywhere in the world you want me to go, not Texas or Illinois. <laughs> you know, no solid reason. I don't hate Texans or anything like that. It was just the the folly of the time. But anyway, so I'm coming up to Illinois for my practice interview. I pull off the interstate for the exit in this place where I'm going to interview. And I was overwhelmed with a sense of home. Oh. I mean, like a big fat <laughs> elephant sat on me and said, hey, guess what? You're home. To the point I had to pull off the road. I had exited off the ramp and there was a wide shoulder there and I had to pull over and stop for a while. Like, okay, awesome. I get it. Yeah. Let's make them nice people, huh? <laughs> yeah. Am I going to like home? And then when uh, I came back months, a couple months later to move in, with all my stuff, the doubts are always there. Is this really the right thing? Am yeah. I really where I need to be? Hmm. It hit me. It, there was a tractor. It, this was in the middle of spring. And there was a tractor working the dirt. And in central Illinois, in these farming communities, people will know exactly what I'm talking about. But the, there's an, an aroma. I guess if you open up a bag of potting soil, it's the same hmm. smell. But when you're driving down the road in central Illinois in the spring and a tractor is working the dirt, that is the aroma in the air. And it just hit me like, uh, yeah, I am home. This is home. Yeah, no. that's awesome. And especially to know that, like, think about it. You had the option to go, no, 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 it's not. I told you I didn't want to be here. <laughs> and, that? Yeah, you listen to me, God, you know, like, because that'll ever work for you. Um, but it's an option, you know what I mean? Where you're able to do that and say like, no, I don't want to do it. But the fact that you're aware enough to go, Ooh, okay. And leaning into it, think about, about those little steps that we have to take to be able to do it. And even on a macro level, we have that option every single day with the trauma and the nonsense that we've been through to go, well, do I want to deal with this thing? Like you had mentioned earlier about, uh, the people that are like, yeah, but it, at least I'm not that person or that thing is worse. It, it's not, especially if it's still pulling on you if it's still pulling you down you still have to process through it even if it was something tiny and stupid now i think most of the trauma that we deal with stems from childhood trauma it's not something that happened in your late 20s it's something that happened in your you know as a seven-year-old as a six-year-old and then showed up in your late 20s and showed back up in your 40s etc because you didn't do anything with it and going back and being aware of that stuff so I, I think there's a lot to that too, where God will kind of show stuff to us to go, Hey, you should be aware of this thing. And then sometimes they're like, that's cool. Thanks. And moving along. And he's like, but you should look at this. All right. You know, whatever you want it, it's here. I'm here to help you. <laughs> and we sometimes just disregard it, but it's, uh, you know, I think those things, when we look at it and we do something about it, that sets off a cascade effect for the miracles to be able to show up, you know, kind of wraps everything together. Absolutely. And the phrase that Jesus often spoke, for those who have the eyes to see, that mm. always stood out to me. Yeah. And more and more so. It, seven years ago, I may not have had the eyes to see what I have the eyes to see today. That, uh, you know, when we're, when we are ready for the next bit, whatever that bit is in life, whether it's healing or whether it's a challenge or whether it's an area of growth, whatever it is, when we're ready for that next bit, we're going to have the eyes to see it. Mm -hmm. And it's going to present itself to us. Sometimes healing is like that. We get to a point where we do have the eyes to see and it's in front of us. What are we going to do with it? Hmm. 
Yeah. And it's on us to do something with it. You know, uh, like I, I think of when people, uh, about the people that are like, you know, well, Jesus will fix it. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll help you. He'll guide you in the direction to go fix the thing. He's not just going to come down and be like, move, Susan. I got this. It's right. not really Step how back. it works. Yeah. Hold on. Like I think of, uh, you remember that Saturday Night Live with, um, uh, who was it? Uh, I forget, but it was Nick, the computer guy. And he would just be like, move, just get in the way, like fix the things. <laughs> it's not how Jesus works. It's not, it's just not how it works at all. Uh, but to be able to actually have the, the sense, the common sense that comes from that to go, all right, cool. What do I do with it? Like I often pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And then the, the courage to go do something with that. Cause if you, mm-hmm. if you get the wisdom and you have knowledge and you understand it all, but you're afraid to move that you're like, I know all these things, but I can't do anything with it. So being able to kind of take all that and go, all right, well, sometimes I just need strength where you're like, all right, God, this is scary. Just okay. I'll pick up the right foot. I mean, I should pick up the left. Okay. And then you're able to kind of move along from there. So I, I think it's interesting how that stuff works at times too, where you're like those little baby faith steps, but it goes back to the trauma to be able to fix that stuff, or at least process through it and figure out what, what do I get from it? Is it something I want to take with me? Is it something I want to remove? So it's no longer part of my journey anymore, you know? And I find that every step you take, God's going to multiply that. Mm. Whenever you take any kind of action, that's going to get multiplied. Uh, Spirit, God, love, universe, whatever Mm -hmm. it is that speaks to you, that's going to come up and partner with you when it's the right moment and you take that step. Trust that there's going to be some acceleration, some momentum added to it, some multiplication of it. Yeah, that's when you know that you are on this path that God has placed before you. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a mantra that I, I think about uh, often. It's the right things happen for me at the right times, always, hmm. because they do. But there are times where I get really upset, where I'm like, man, why isn't this thing happening? Oh, because it's not the right time. Well, is the right time like now? What about like now? And how about now? And, you know, I feel like I'm like that little kid in the back. Like, hey, God, are we there yet? And he's like, shut up. We are not there yet. Just calm down. I'm like, okay, cool. Are we there yet? <laughs> and I'm on the opposite part of that. Uh, I'm an Enneagram 9 for anyone who's into the Enneagram. So I tend to just kind of numb out when things get overwhelming. So Mm. when there's something big in front of me, and that's why pursuing uncomfortable is such a compelling title for me, because it's a reminder to myself to do the work, to lean into it, to get it overcome and get it, whatever it is out of your life. But my tendency is to say, yeah, that seems big. Hey, look, look what's on (laughs) Netflix now. To moonwalk out out of the situation. (laughs) Yeah. Or, you know, at least for a moment to get a few breaths and the older I get, the more wisdom that comes my way. I use that reflex, that instinct as a time to take a breath and remind myself that I now have the eyes to see this. Yeah, It is time. The step I take, I don't have to have the whole plan together. I don't have to have every bit of information I need. Yeah. I'm going to take a step and I'm going to trust that that's going to be multiplied. That's a big thing. And especially with the show, like congrats for stepping out and being vulnerable with that. You know, this is a big thing that a lot of people talk about doing a podcast, but they'll never get to the first episode. You and I were shooting the breeze about being 50 plus episodes in and pursuing the uncomfortable. So really well done on you for for doing that, leaning in and being an example for it. Thank you. And to you also. However, I, it, I do question my decision of showing these interviews on YouTube because a lot of times, you know, I'm an emotional gal. And when people are going through their stories, the tears are coming down, the red, I am not a pretty crier. <laughs> I'm a red, puffy crier. <laughs> like, hey, let's put this on YouTube. Correct decision there. Well, as we talked about before, um, trimming sometimes uh, will be done by itself. So the people that stick around and enjoy those things, I think that's, you know, one of the biggest things about podcasting 
and I think it's probably two big things about life. Just got to be authentic and consistent. And those are things yeah. that we know from having successful podcasts. And I think a lot of people that enjoy our shows enjoy us and the stuff that we add to it, the flavor of things. And some of that's your flavor. You know, if you're just a crying mess for an hour every episode, actually, you know, there are probably people that are into that sort of thing too, but that's a different story. So, I recall a persona from the 1980s who that was her brand, but not my yeah. brand. <laughs> yeah, not your brand. I mean, if that's what you wanted to do, then go for it. Um, right. But I think there's little communities for everybody. I mean, we talked about the stuff like uh, the religious side of this or the, the faith side of it. And there are different people that connect with different people. And you don't have to connect with everybody, but you do need to connect with yourself. You know, and I think that's something that we as people sometimes just easily get away from where we don't want to connect with ourselves, as, as you talked about before, of like, ah, well, you know, at least I'm not in that spot or that thing didn't happen to me. And it's like, okay, cool. But that story no longer actually works. Like, yeah. what about your stuff and how do you do things differently? Um, but that's, that's on us. We got to look at ourselves at first. It's like, people aren't going to save you. So when I was talking about the people that are um, like, uh, you know, Jesus is going to save me. I think of that joke where, you know, there was people that were in a flood, they're on top of the roof and God mm -hmm. sent a boat, a plane, a helicopter, whatever. And he's like, I sent all these things to you. I was trying to help you. And it's for us as people to be able to actually do something with the things that are in front of us instead of not pursuing that uncomfortable and just diving deeper inside and going, all right, this sucks a little bit and I die a little bit, but you know, it's all right. It's okay. At least I'm not in some third world country. I have food on my table. It's like, yeah, okay, cool. But are, do you hate life? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, well, we should fix that. We should do something different. And that's the thing. Life is so full of nuance. It's always a fine line of, you know, I can't fix myself. I do need that holy presence in my life. I do mm -hmm. depend on that. But it is also dependent upon my action and finding that yeah. nuance, that balance of God's presence and my persistence and my actions. And then finding that balance of what do I really, really want in life? And am I willing to put in the work to get that? Mm -hmm. And if I'm not, where does the adjustment need to come? Yeah. In what I want or in what I'm willing to do? There's so much nuance in life. And I have found that, I don't know if you can identify with this or not, Nick, but my prayer style, and this so works for me, let me tell you, is generally it's a whole lot of, okay, God, here's what I want. And here's the parameters. I'm thinking if we could work within this little space here, that would be fantastic. And here's the time frame I'm looking at. Can we make this happen? But it, those aren't the words I use. But sure. for so much of my life, that was how I was praying. Yeah. <laughs> it's so one, there's no like totally wrong way to pray. But I guess if you're just yelling at God the entire time, everybody up there might frown upon it but realistically to be able to do that so what what happened at one point where you're like hold up i need to change this yeah when i was called into ministry didn't see that coming nothing i ever pursued and it was i think is fair to say well outside of my comfort zone hmm. i was a molecular biologist i was a lab rat i was a teacher and uh my prayers were in that space. I mean, those weren't the words I used, but I wanted God to work within what was comfortable for me to bring about the things I wanted. Yeah. And I wanted it quickly. Makes sense. And when I was faced with this whole calling into ministry business, and that's a whole other story for a whole other day, uh, that just blew me wide open. And mm. my prayers became very authentic very real yeah. and very much embracing that Romans 8 passage of sometimes the sighs are too deep for human words and the spirit within me is going to do the heavy lifting today because yeah. I don't have it myself. Oh yeah, big time. Like there are times where you can't speak. Oh, it's that verse where uh, the Holy Spirit will speak in grunts and moans and groans. 
and there size too deep for human words. Yeah. yeah. And it, when you can sit on that and you're like, I don't, I don't know how to put this, but I can feel it toward you, you know, and mm -hmm. being able to put that out there, that's a huge thing. But <laughs> yeah, it is interesting. Like, uh, when you think about prayer should be a certain way, but then one point you get to a point where it's you and your friend and your father, and you're having that conversation and you're like this, how do I deal with this? And I think it's super cute for you to be like, I would really like it in this by this time, like this. Okay. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye. Let me know when it's done. And amen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, too good. So what's the biggest <laughs> monster shadowing your life these days? Hmm. Enjoying the present. I, uh, mm. I can easily get into future Nick thinking about things that have to happen way down the road. And I can easily jump into the stuff that's happened before and how it translates into what I'm doing now. And it's been easy for me ever since I was a little kid to look at things from a third party so I can be kind of a fly on the wall, look at all of those. But sometimes I don't just sit here and say, thanks. You know, like I'm, I love what I have. And I've been working on that. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of the biggest monster that I'm working on because that allows me, when I get into those grateful moments, it allows me to look at things differently. Even if I was in a great spot looking at something, having that little bit of gratitude and understanding the spot that I'm at and the, the decisions I've made to get here with the faith that I have and God's love and grace, it almost just makes me get goosebumps each time I think about that. And it's not like, it, that just comes up in the middle of a meeting or in the middle of shooting a video or with a client or on an interview or what have you. And it's easy for me to just go, 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 where doing what I can to be more present and work in those specific moments and appreciating the incremental growth. Uh, I'd always been one of those people that really want to knock out every single thing that I can. And I get super frustrated, like I'd mentioned earlier, where I'm like, hey, God, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> and God can see that it's like 100 yards away. And he's like, yeah, we'll get there. But I don't know if you're going to last. Like, I might kill you before that. And I'm like, but are we there yet? <laughs> are we there yet? Are we there yet? Where realistically, I should just sit back and enjoy, enjoy the ride and enjoy what comes from that. And that's a thing that I, I think would be the big monster that I'm kind of working through. So next, sit down, because this is going to be a shocking revelation. But I'm getting a sense that you might be a type A personality. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I believe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and gratitude is such, it's the secret sauce, isn't it? Yeah. It keeps us focused on what we have, yeah, not on what's missing. Mm -hmm. and, and I those love feelings that you brought of... that up. Yeah. Well, I think uh, like we were talking about, there are certain things that you can't say, you just can't put into words and it's the feeling and being able to communicate that with the higher power or whatever it is. Even if you communicate that with yourself, there are deeper feelings that you need to feel and feeling the gratitude of this thing that I'm working on, or even this conversation, like here I am in the middle of the day where I have other things that are going on, but I get to have a conversation with you. You've asked me to be on the show. I'm honored in that sort of way. I could also look at it and be like, oh, oh my God, I got to do another interview today. Jeez, yeah, this all these this. interviews. Oh God. But that's not the case because this is, this is life. These are the magical moments and that's what it's about. So I feel appreciative that I get to have these magical moments. Just sometimes I'm, I'm appreciative, but I'm like, oh, that's cool. And what about this thing? And what about this? And what about that? Where really owning that moment. And I think sitting in that moment allows us to then pull in those things from the future and start coming to us a lot faster because we're actively feeling that. Fred Rogers was interviewed by Chris Rose once and Chris Rose asked him about the magnitude of people he has influenced. Yeah. And Fred Rogers would never cut anyone off and he didn't cut Chris Rose off, but he... I think was ready to, but his response was, none of that matters. The only thing that matters is you are right in front of me right now in this moment. That's the yeah. only number that matters. If we can live in the moment, be present to the people in front of us, that is what's important. Yeah. And that's what I heard you saying. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, my other takeaway from this conversation that we've had today is library bar is a thing and can be more of a thing. Yeah. Folks, if you are listening to this and Create you are one. inspired, <laughs> library bar. That's Make it. it happen. Yep. Let us know. We'll come. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Nick, this has been fun. I could talk to you for the rest of the day. I don't know <laughs> if the, the listeners want to hang in for hours long conversations. Yeah, we'll let them go. Yeah, <laughs> if so, they can let me know and we'll have you back again. Yeah, but I, I would like you to give on. you the last word today. What would you like to leave us with as we close? Well, I want to leave it with a praise to you. Again, thank you for stepping out doing what you felt to be uncomfortable and setting up a platform to help other people talk about the things that they're pursuing that's been uncomfortable for them. So I want to thank you for having me on the show um, and for being a part of it. I'd love to have you on my show at some point. If I can do a nice little plug here, the show is the Mindset and Self Mastery Show. We talk about some similar things that I'm sure you and your guests get into. Uh, but that's, it's really about the journey that I'm on to be able to pursue self mastery, which is kind of just discipline and uh, enjoy life. But I appreciate you doing what you've done because as we said earlier, uh, a lot of people won't do the first episode. A lot of people won't get past 10 or 50 and you just keep rocking with it. So thank you for doing what you do. Thank you, Nick. And folks, you don't have to search far for his podcast. It's an amazing podcast. The link is in the show notes. Make sure you click on it and check it out. Nick, this has been amazing. Thanks, friend, for joining me today. I know I feel inspired talking to you and I hope other folks do. And if you hear nothing else from us today, hear this. We believe in you, but that really doesn't matter because there's a higher power that believes in you. Whether or not you believe in that higher power, that higher power believes in you. And whatever mountain is in front of you, whatever monster's shadow you are in at the moment, that doesn't have to have the last word. Lean into it, pursue it, embrace the difficult things, and find light in the other side. Thank you, Nick, for joining today. Thank you.